hybrid systems. And there is really no need to have a general purpose processor on these. And so uh, what uh, other faculty in this project have come up with is an accelerator-based uh, architecture which is efficient in energy, weight, and functionality for a specialized hybrid system as this. And finally, the third one, the third one is uh, innovations in manufacturing. So previously, when the project started, the way we would build one of these is you, you would laser cut the parts in the lab, and Rob Wood, who's the PI of the project, would go into, uh, would go, uh, get under the microscope and hand assemble these, and that would take him half a day, and that's clearly not scalable. So one of his uh, graduate students, Prateek, came up with this uh, technology called pop-up MEMS manufacturing, which is now being popularized. He actually has a startup on these lines. Uh, that enables mass production of these, uh, uh, of micro uh, MEMS uh, items such as these. And here you can see, basically the idea here is you shift the complexity from, uh, de to design. So at design space, you make up these complicated CAD models that you can quickly assemble and here you can see it gets assembled and you can release and you get an actual V. And so they can be produced in mass. And I mean, the only point I want to make here is that you can, these are now available. So let's look at uh, what you can do with a swarm of microwave vehicles such as these. So why use these? And I'll, I'll suggest four examples. The first one is crop pollination. And this is a good example, highlights two of the main advantages of such Swarms. The first one is micro manipulation. If you want to pollinate flowers, you want something small, and the size of this helps that. The second one is a massively parallel operation. So if you want to populate a large, uh, a large farm, you don't want. Uh, it's hard to use five or ten robots, and you want large swarms of these. And so uh, micro, so MAV swarms such as these can be used for uh, crop pollination. You can think of covert operations such as surveillance. Obviously, because of the size, you can use these to do uh, other sorts of covert operations. Uh, as sending them into hazardous areas. So instead of first responders sending uh, such micro vehicle swarms in, uh, in the case of an earthquake or a fire, and at least letting them map out what is going on inside before you actually send the first responders to an earthquake application. And finally, tracking dynamic phenomena, such as uh, a plume uh, or a chemical, a chemical plume or a oil spill, so because these are mobile, you can make them localize the source or track the boundary, and you can use these swamps. Are you sure about the micro-manipulation about? Uh, so pollination of flowers, for example. Right? So you have flowers that are very small, and being able to do pollination at that scale, you, it's harder to do with larger aerial vehicles, is my point. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Uh, I'm not sold on the application, but... Uh, I mean, think of it as a futuristic. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, uh, and I can actually get the details, I mean, uh, and the reason why particularly the robots are suited for this is, like, the aerial dynamics. So, again, there are examples from nature where the kinds of maneuvers that honeybees can do, it's very hard to do with other mechanisms. So flapping wings are particularly suited for that. Um, and again, we are gradually, by we, I mean, other uh, people in the project are demonstrating uh, those sorts of maneuvers, which are harder to do with regular rotary aerial vehicles. But, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's one of the future applications. So building such systems have many challenges, and I'm going to highlight three of them. The first challenge is energy. Uh, like I mentioned, these aerial vehicles carry the battery that they are fueled off of. Here is the projected uh, power, power budget of a robo B. And as you can see, 91% is consumed by the power actuator and 6% by the control actuator. So actuation takes 97% of the total energy budget. So what this means is there is about 3% left for the sensing and computing on it. So what you can do are very simple things. Uh, these are the e uh, this is uh, numbers from E-Flight M6 to helicopters we use for our test bed. And again, the processor consumes around 11 milliwatts, the radio consumes around 50, and the actuation consumes somewhere between 1800 and 2700 milliwatts. So it's an order of magnitude higher, and so actuation dominates the energy. And even with these numbers, the expected flight times are around 10 minutes. Uh, yeah, the only point here is basically sensing and computing takes uh, is, is a very small portion. The second challenge is coordination. So if you have hundreds of these micro vehicles, programming or tasking each of these is going to be hard. And so you want to think of these swarms as one unit and not address them individually. 
and reasoning about any sort of inter uh, MAV coordination, uh, any uh, inter MAV communication is again somewhat harder. And this only gets exacerbated by the fact that they can only do simple things. And finally, uh, there is inherent uncertainty in the deployment. If you have hundreds of these, then you can potentially imagine individual error in localization sensing, actuation. There might be individual failures. And finally, when they go out in the real world, there are dynamic conditions such as wind, et cetera, which uh, drive uh, the deployment. Uh, uh, and uh, building uh, such a micro vehicle swap inherently is, is inherently interdisciplinary. So I, I, I think of it as being from five sort of uh, five computer science areas, and these are the following. So <laughs> building or uh, optimizing the embedded systems that actually drive these, uh, looking at wireless networking and how mobility impacts wireless networking, uh, what sorts of sensors, so uh, perception meaning what sorts of sensing goes on such a vehicle, and, uh, given the weight and energy budgets. And given the sensing, what sort of estimation control algorithms go on them? And finally, if you have many of these, what coordination mechanisms go on it? Uh, what I'm going to talk mostly about today is um, the coordination aspect and a system we built to coordinate such micro vehicle swarms. I'll come back to this picture and tell you more about some of my other contributions in these other areas during my graduate work. All right. Um, so, for coordinating micro vehicle swarms, we built this system called Karma. Uh, it's a framework to program and coordinate such swarms. It, uh, it alleviates each of the challenges I mentioned before. Uh, it provides a simplified programming model that lets you break down complicated applications into simple things that these MAVs can do. It provides a centralized coordination mechanism. And finally, it uh, gives you graceful degradation to uh, sort of the environmental conditions and inherent uncertainty that exists. And throughout my talk, I use the I use crop pollination as a driving application. The um, and roughly it's as follows: if you think of this as the world, uh, the application is that the MAVs need to go out and look for where the flowers are in bloom, uh, which is roughly that area, uh, and then they need to go uh, do the task of pollination to that area. Okay. Uh, so the first observation that I would make is that the, uh, like I mentioned throughout, the flight times of these MAVs is very limited. And so the uh, mode of operation typically is they go out to the world, do something, come back, recharge, go out, do something again. So our first idea is that you can use this central place where you recharge as uh, a place to coordinate. And this is something we call the high drone model. And the high drone model is as follows. There's a central hive denoted by this big machine. Uh, it acts as the coordinator, and it can recharge the MAVs. The MAVs are simple drones. Uh, on every round trip, they do a simple task, come back, tell the hive what it did. And the hive then uses that to, uh, to for future deployments, so to adjust the future deployments. So here's a cartoon execution. Drone goes out, does a simple task, does, uh, does some sensing, comes back, tells the hive what it found, and this goes on and up. And as time progresses, the hive gets a better idea of what's going on in the world, and it uses that information to get a few of these tasks. Um, the second uh, thing I found uh, is the programming model. And this programming model, at some level, is inspired by the cluster computing models proposed these days. Um, so like I said, we have a task called, uh, that, that is to formulate crop. And the idea is to break the task down into simpler, uh, uh, or break the application down into simpler tasks called behaviors. Uh, so in this case, like I mentioned initially, there's a search behavior and there's a pollinate behavior. So I want to go search where the flowers are in blue, and then I want to go pollinate in those areas. Breaking this down has two advantages. The first one is it breaks an application down into simpler things that the MAVs can actually execute. And secondly, it actually exhibits the inherent parallelism that exists in the application. So because I have a large form, I can actually execute many things in parallel. And so you can think of a behavior as something that each MAV, uh, something that an MAV executes in a round trip. So it does a simple action, so it, it goes, does a simple random walk and a sensing or an actuation task, and does this repeatedly. So that's what a behavior is. And the second characteristic is that these behaviors produce information on execution. So for example, if I'm searching for a flower, it goes out, it says, are there flowers here, are there flowers here? 
And so if it finds them, it comes back, tells the higher that I did find or, or not. And like I mentioned earlier, the hive uses this information to drive future deployments. So let's look at how you can compose an application in this world. I prove, so again, here's our world, here are a few, a few flowers in blue, and the first task we have is a search task, uh, and this gives out information called flowers. And you have a second uh, here which is called pollinate, it says if you find flowers, do, do this. So what the, this ends up being is an indirect way of wiring behaviors into a control program. And this is sort of the key idea to, and what this does is you can actually have arbitrarily complicated control flow graphs that, are, uh, that have these simple behaviors as components. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you other applications we've built other than pollination, but you can have, you can uh, build, like, a, like I say here, you can build arbitrarily uh, complicated applications with this simple uh, sort of programming architecture. And the third key idea in our system is uh, like I mentioned, we want to use these MAV swarms to work in large areas. And so we need a way to reason about space. Again, we have our world, and, and the way we reason about space is basically by breaking the world down. So think of a tiling. Uh, here, I've broken them down into hexagons, and there are seven regions. But the key idea is the way these regions are broken down is you need an external localization mechanism that can identify where uh, these bees are. So you break the world into regions, and the only requirement is that you be able to tell the MAV that you currently you are in a certain region. So you can break these, this room down into four pieces and say what, regions one, two, three, four, and the only requirement from our system is that you be able to tell the MAV will query where am I, and just needs to say you are in region X. So as long as you can provide a coarse localization mechanism, you can reason about uh, space uh, in, in, in the following way. And what this does is the following. So the problem of coordination now becomes how many MAVs do I deploy in region X to execute a behavior Y? Does that make sense? All right. Uh, so yeah, the, the key result of uh, tiling the world into these regions is that you turn the coordination problem into a scheduling problem at the hive. And yeah. So do you yeah. have one hive per tile or one hive per day? No, you have one hive for the whole uh, system. So there's only one hive, and I've not said any more multiple hives. And yeah. Um, so there's no computer vision you know, for our recognition task? There isn't. So uh, like, I, uh, like I mentioned earlier, so all I'm thinking about at this point is how do I coordinate these things? Some of the perception and so on is, is, is dumbed down. And I'll come back to, it, to the end, towards the end, and tell you how we can incorporate some of these. So at this point, I'm only worried about, I have a task, and how do I break it down to execute it in the world? The individual pieces, so for example, how am I sensing the flower, or how am I detecting something, is something that we are basically abstracting out. Yeah. Any other questions? So let's look at, uh, like I mentioned, it's turned into a scheduling problem. So let's look at how scheduling works in Chrome. Uh, in Karma. Uh, the problem is basically how do you allocate sorties or these MAVs to behavior region pairs. I have these behaviors that I, that I want to execute and I have these regions where I want to execute them. So how do I allocate the MAVs I have to the behavior region pairs? Yeah? I thought you were selling the methods programming model. It's, it's, uh, so it's basically inspired by this, but uh, there are very stark differences. For example, uh, the what you operate in MapReduce is a single file of data, and there's really no geometric correlation. There, yeah, there, so there, there, yeah. I mean, it's basically inspired from uh, ideas I, I mentioned earlier. It's basically like classic computing models uh, inspired from the programming model. At least it's inspired from there. And how do you adapt that to? Yeah. Uh, and so uh, again, scheduling is a large area. All we do, uh, our policy is basically how do we minimize the total application time while being fair to all the active behaviors. So if I have two active behaviors, I want to make equal progress for each behavior while minimizing the total application time. That's, the, that's basically the scheduling policy. 
So uh, we're not going to sort of technically detail. Let me walk you through how an execution in Karma works. We have our program. We have uh, which I mentioned initially. There is uh, the search. If I find flowers, then I'll pause it. Here is our world. And for this toy example, the hive has let's assume five MAVs. Initially, the task is empty. Uh, we tile the world into seven regions, and the hive has no knowledge of what's working on the world. Uh, because the search behavior is not dependent on any other information, we can we start out with uh, the search behavior as the only active behavior, and it's not been executed in any of them. So there are seven search behaviors to be executed in each of the regions from one through seven. Because I have five MAVs, I deploy them to the five regions I can. Uh, they search there, they come back, and tell the hive that there's actually flowers in uh, regions one and two. And we still have like two search, uh, search behaviors in regions six and seven remaining. But we also added a pollinate behavior in regions one and two because we found flowers. And those are added to the queue as well. Uh, now, again, we deploy two for uh, uh, the pollinate behavior, one each in regions one and two, and the remaining search behavior uh, in regions six and seven. They come back. Uh, let's assume uh, for discussion that they completed a third of the pollinate task in regions one and two. So we deployed one MAV that completed a third of the task. So Karma now reasons that one MAV, one MAV does a third of the task, so I need to deploy two to complete the two thirds of the task that's remaining, which is what it does. Uh, and they come back and they complete the pollinate behavior. So hopefully you get a rough idea of how Karma is able to reason. Uh, and the only metric it uses to reason is how much work is being done by an MAV in a region for the behavior. And yeah. How do you estimate that? I mean, how does so how we estimate that, that is by the first uh, first round. So we, we don't have any idea before. You have uh, you send them out, uh, they come back, and that's uh, so. The first round trip is no, used I, as I a understand test. how you can extrapolate. I'm just saying, how do you do it in the first round? I mean, let's say uh, a goes out and it says, I pollinated a flower. Uh, and I don't know if that's a third or a tenth or a hundredth of my task. Right. So uh, that, that brings me to something that I did not mention, which is uh, as the applicant programmer needs to quantify the behavior. And I'll come to the specification in a little bit. But basically, you need to tell us not just pollinate this region, but I need a certain number. So it needs to be quantified for us to be able to reason about how much work is being done. So uh, if you, if, for example, if you want to search a given region to achieve coverage, say I want 500 sensor readings, say I sampled it 500 times and uh, I found n flowers. And that gives us. So, so this is an output of the search phase. Uh, the it's, number it's of flowers that are available to pollinate. Yes. So uh, for the pollinate behavior, it's your from how many how many flowers I found, and that tells me a rough estimate of how much pollination has to be done. Yeah. But so yeah. And those scheduling problems, they are not unique to this application. We're not even new. Those just the traditional scheduling problems, right? Sure. I mean, I'm, okay. I, I'm not claiming. But the, here with the hive, they have a high computing power, you can do complicated right. things. That's, like, okay. that's part of the other one, yeah. I mean, so we, uh, when we started this class, we, uh, we started with the assumption that these can hardly do anything. And so mm -hmm. we want to say, how can we do, how, how can we do anything with a swarm of these MAVs, right? So, uh, yeah. So yeah, I mean, I, so I, th I think that's an interesting assumption, right? So I, I, I know, I'm sure you guys are familiar with the sort of the, the biomem stuff, right? So uh, part of the challenge with this particular micro UAV thing has always been power, right? So that- It's, yeah, it's that, that, I mean, I showed you the initial budget. From that budget, like 15 milliwatts is what is allocated to computing and sensing. Right, right. But, but let's say you had, so, so I think that that's driven a, a particular set of assumptions about how this system is built. Right. Mm -hmm. So let's say instead of that, I have, you know, one of these actual insects that I've jammed, you know, uh, electrodes into, and I can right. I can steer this thing around for days. Right? right. So now it seems like that challenges this entire model because the amount that an insect can do 
in the field is, is much, much bigger, right? And so sure. this model of aggregating information at the hive seems to start to, to break down, right? So have you guys done any analysis just looking at, you know, the, the, the trade-off there as you start to increase the amount that the bee can do, right, in, in a single sort? So I don't have a hard number, but we've spent some time thinking about it. And I'll, I'll sort of come back to, uh, so ideally where I see this going is gradually deploy pieces of the system we built, which is, in, which is central in the swarm. So how do you do these things in a distributed fashion is where uh, we are going now. And I sort of come back to sort of some of the current work, and this goes back to some question that came here, which is what is the perception, what is the control, which, which are also questions I've skipped. Uh, but bringing them back uh, to build a system, and I'll hopefully address this uh, is out of the current work and future work. Uh, okay. Yeah. Why do you need to have the radio on when the uh, NAV is in flight? We do not. Uh, at some level, we don't assume that uh, they have radios at all. They just come back, and when they have, when they land at the hive is when they tell the information, uh, pass the information to the uh, hive. Uh, in your first slide, you had the budget for a budget which has radio on the radio on. Yes, that's just to compare. Like, I mean, for these sorts of embedded systems, people always, uh, so at least traditionally in sensor networks, there's this idea that the computing takes uh, little energy and communication is sort of the bulk of the energy. This is just to provide a comparison. Um, there are also other reasons why you might have, want to have a radio. For example, I said you need a service where you say, the, the MAV query is which region am I in? And somebody tells it which region it is in. And so for that, you, so there are some practical considerations, but uh, there is no inter-MAV communication going on. Then, yeah, the radio is not being used for any port. Yeah. yeah? How long does it take to recharge? Uh, it takes a while. So uh, again, we've done some measurements. Turns out uh, if the flight time is uh, a certain amount, it takes twice. Again, so, there are a lot of characters. So now you have to get into battery characteristics, there's a recharge characteristics, and so on. But if you want to be in the safe sort of region, it takes about a little while. Uh, so in the scheduling, you kind of have to take that into account. Right? Yes. While one set of these uh, is waiting, the other set can go out and do its work, and then you kind of swap. Not right. necessarily. If, so again, I, so one of the caveats of this whole model is something called information latency, which I'll come to. But if you are, if you have a fixed amount of work, then it doesn't matter. Uh, so assume uh, the example of crop pollination. At this given time, there are 100 flowers that have been pollinated, and that's a fixed amount of work. And there's a certain amount of work which I have to search and watch, right? So for that, it does not matter. I can send them out in bulk, they come back, recharge in bulk, and I send them out again. Uh, because the amount of work I can do given the resources I have is fixed, and also the amount of work that needs to be done is fixed. But if you have something that's dynamic, so for example, if I'm tracking a mobile target or something like that, then things change. Uh, and then you have to do, you have to adapt to that, and I'll sort of touch, touch on that <coughs> a little bit. Any other questions? All right. So uh, I hope this walkthrough gave you an idea of how uh, our system works. Uh, here's again a quick recap of the three key ideas. The first one is this hive drone architecture where we split, uh, we move the coordination to the central hive and make these uh, MAVs very simple. Uh, the second one is the programming model where we break the application down into behaviors. And like I said, this has two advantages. The first one is uh, that you get uh, pieces that can actually be executed on the MAV. And secondly, it exposes the inherent parallelism that exists in uh, the application. And finally, reasoning about space, we tile the world into regions, and this converts the problem of coordination into one of scheduling, uh, which, again, uh, makes it easy to reason. So uh, to, in order to experiment with uh, such MAVs, it's really hard to deploy 100 and actually test them out and test your algorithm as well. So what we wanted was to simulate uh, these. And for this, we built a simulator called Symbiotic. Uh, I want to recognize the primary author on this work is Brian Kate, who's a graduate student who worked with me. The, the main thing we want, yeah. Just, just a quick question. Mm -hmm. um, do, you, do you guys also consider 3D? So your tile is pretty much just 2D. 
Right. But if you think about like I don't know building or something, then you might actually want to consider 3D as well. Um, I haven't quite thought about. I mean, uh, not quite. Uh, it, yeah, it I seems guess, like I it imagine might be, have, Yeah, it might have some impact on your programming model too. Right. Depending on how you express the uh, the region, right? So yeah, I'm not sure if it changes all that much. I can still reason about behavior region pairs. The the fact that you're on the first floor or second floor doesn't necessarily matter as I'm doing it now because uh, I don't so I don't expose any geometric correlation so where it will matter is if you if, if the MAVs actually know region 1 is next to region 2 so if I finish in region 1 I can actually go to region 2 and continue the work that I'm doing you see what I'm saying there, there's some jump so the fact that these tiles exist in space ha and they have some geometric correlation and that can be exploited in interesting ways but at this point, we are not doing any such. If we did, then the three dim third dimension actually comes into play. Otherwise, I can just number them in sequence, and I say, go do work in region 18. The fact that it's on second floor or on third floor is not as uh, yeah. So, is this is on uh, the resource contention of the bees when they go to work together. Uh, I mean, the flower is very small and not. Even if there's a fixed amount of work, if you have a million bees, they can't really work on the same flower at the same time. Sure. Uh, yeah, uh, this is true. The, but uh, the way we think of these flowers is that, again, the, the work to be done is much bigger than the number of, again, this is true for crop pollination. This is also true for if you're searching large areas or if you're doing some sort of bloom tracking. Um, if you had contention then, Again, I'm not sure these, these these models work very well when you think of the amount of work to be done is proportion is in the same order as the number of MAVs. But there's only one task to be done per MAV. It's not clear you need to go to this extent of reasoning about uh, the world. Uh, but it might take a long time for the task to be done, except that you know the space is constraining how many. Yeah. So this gets into yeah this gets into a region of doing like very precise, uh, probably longer term tasks. Which again, uh, where we are in terms of the MAVs I'm thinking of, it's harder. It, it, it's somewhat harder to do. The uh, again we, again this stem from very specific assumptions, right? So the assumption was the application is something that is um, that is on the lines of crop pollination where. If I do 95, 98 percent of the task, it's, it's okay. Like if I feel, miss a few flowers, it's okay. If I if I do the rough thing, it's okay. So those sorts of uh, and, and adapting uh, things like tracking to that model. So how do I actually search this world uh, for uh, or, or do surveillance in, in this world? So I do a lot of I do a lot of search and over provision in terms of coverage. So it comes from a very specific set of assumptions. Yeah. And do you consider different type of bees? Some bees in like a CPU, some bees that have a high memory CPU? Right. So you, you can think of uh, them having different functionality. For example, some can actually detect the flowers, or some can, others can do other things. Uh, in this work, we don't, uh, we don't. But actually, again, I'm not giving you the, all the details of uh, the system we built. You can do uh, you can do a variety of things in the system we built, and this is something that you can incorporate into it. Uh, I'm not demonstrating that today, but yeah, it's something that you can update. Any other? All right. So uh, to study these sorts of MAVs, uh, we wanted a simulator that gave us the following four properties. Uh, so we obviously want to test scalability. We want to deploy many, many of these and be able to test how it works. Uh, variable fidelity was again an interesting question, which is uh, when we started out, you can do research, like I mentioned, in many of these areas. And what uh, what we wanted were, from the simulator was, suppose there was a control algorithm that you want to test. That person probably does not care about what sorts of networking goes on. Just said, hey, give me some base level. Whereas somebody who's testing some sort of data dissemination algorithm needs very specific networking stack and does not care about what control behavior goes on it. So being able to test different things at different levels of complexity is something that we wanted. And completeness meaning, again, I want to be able to test every aspect of uh, an MAV swarm. I want to be able to 
uh, simulate the particular sensor I have, I want to be able to simulate the particular networking protocol I have, and so on. And finally, stage deployment, which is, at the end of the day, we want to realize these in uh, actual MAVs, but directly implementing these on MAVs might be hard, so I want to be able to do that in a staged fashion. And we tested a variety of uh, simulators, uh, robotic simulators and networking simulators that, that are out there, and we found them wanting uh, mainly in terms, uh, for the robotic simulators, mainly in terms of scale. So things like player stage and RASP uh, are things that I've used, but uh, scaling them beyond 20, 30 robots is very hard. Uh, again, the networking uh, ones, they, they don't give, give you the realism of uh, the robotic uh, simulator. So what we did was we built Symbiotic, which is a simulator to simulate uh, microbial vehicle swarms. It's a custom simulator built uh, in Java. It's built on top of JBullet, which is a 60 degree of freedom physics engine. So all the physics is simulated in the physics engine. It's uh, extremely modular in design. This is what gives you sort of the variable fidelity. You can go to, diff I mean, it's, it has many, many levels of abstraction. You can go to uh, different level of levels of abstraction depending on your need. Uh, and finally, it's uh, easier to deploy, and I'll come to this point. Here is a picture of the visualization. Here are two uh, videos of uh, 50 MAVs doing random walk, here's a simple world, here's a maze. We built, uh, we have libraries to do a variety of things. There are uh, a variety of sensors implemented. You can do optic flow, you can have uh, laser range finders, you can have an omniscient uh, location sensor like a GPS. Uh, we've implemented uh, different radio propagation models. You can do uh, a variety of networking experiments. You, uh, because it's uh, built on top of the physics engine, you can get real world conditions such as gravity and collisions. We also built models for wind uh, that have been extended in the simulator. And again, we have libraries to build uh, worlds such as mazes, mines, buildings, and so on. Uh, you can generalize these very, uh, sort of generate these very quickly. And finally, there is a provision for 3D visualization, which is what you're seeing. Uh, and there's provision for logging as you run these experiments. And finally, there's provision for repeated simulation. Many of these algorithms you might want to test repeatedly. So I want to run the same thing 100 times, starting with a different random seed to give me some statistical significance. You can do that uh, easily. Uh, Symbiotic runs to about 40,000 lines of code in Java, and it's available uh, open source. Uh, if you guys are interested in trying it out, you're welcome to. I maintain it now. So if you have any questions, I'm welcome to answer that as well. Uh, the, the final point I made was ease of deployment. So uh, to, uh, as a, uh, along with Symbiotic, we have an associated test bed. The test bed has these E-Flight MCX2 micro helicopters. They're about 15, 20 centimeters in diameter, and you can buy them off the shelf. They're about $100 and they are TIE helicopters, uh, RC helicopters. We also have an associated test bed. It's a 25 feet by 20 feet room uh, equipped with these Wicon motion capture uh, cameras. What these Wicon motion capture cameras give us is very precise location at very high frequency and they do that by, uh, so what we do is we put these markers called the Wicon markers and these are retroreflective markers. The cameras are, mm -hmm. have an IR uh, transmitter receiver, so they basically track these at high precision, like in millimeter precision at hundreds of hertz. And so that's uh, how we can uh, get location. And finally, this is integrated with Symbiotic. And the way we do it is uh, basically Symbiotic queries the uh, Wicon system for the location. And it then injects that location into the simulator. Because again, we're simulating this in a physics engine. Uh, the location gets injected into the simulation. And the control happens inside the physics engine. This control is then passed out to, so what we did was you have these RC controllers, you basically detach the wireless component of it and we have those connected to a computer. Actually, if you can see it here, there are these wires hanging, those are antennas for individual helicopters. So basically those commands get sent out through the computer to uh, these and then they get controlled in our test bed. Uh, so you, this has advantages of, uh, that is similar to any other hardware in the loop system. I can think of flying the helicopters, they're flying in the real world, but in symbiotic, they're flying in a virtual world. You can think of attaching virtual sensors to them and so on. So they have it. Uh, one common question uh, we had was uh, the Wicon system is a fairly expensive piece of uh, equipment. Uh, we had questions whether our uh, deployment is tied to the Wicon system. For this, what we did was uh, we bought the Microsoft Kinect sensors uh, and we used. Uh, Instead of the Wicon system, we use the Connect to control the helicopter, and we did a demonstration of this 
So uh, the setup actually has no, uh, does not depend on the Wicom system. It can have any other localization mechanism uh, as long as there's something that's true. So Karma is implemented on top of uh, symbiotics. Yeah. Was it very hard to put a small um, processor mode brain on the? So at this, uh, so the way I showed you now, there was no. I mean, we don't have custom electronics, but I'll show you later. We have our own processor and so on. Uh, very hard. I mean, we we built our own boards for this. Um, the harder part is the perception. So given the fact that we have very stringent weight constraints, what perception can we do on this? So this is a bigger challenge. Uh, but as I'm showing you now, these are commercial off-the-shelf helicopters. What we do is we get the helicopter, they're controlled by this, uh, so maybe, yeah, we basically take the... Uh, so uh, Karma is implemented on top of uh, symbiotic. Uh, like I've described before, application is a set of behaviors, but for each behavior, you need to specify the following three things. You need to give us a binary that is, that is the actual behavior that is executed on the MAV. Uh, we don't have strict guidelines on this, but basically the idea is that this does some simple actuation, say something like a random walk, and a sensing or an actuation task. Right? So there's some simple movement and sensing and an actuation. And hopefully this applied repeatedly gives you the coverage you want in a given region. Along with this, uh, you also need to provide two different things, and this is this comes back to Jeff's question. The first one is an activation predicate, telling us when the behavior is activated, so that the karma knows when to activate it. And this all this is based on the information collected uh, from other behaviors. And the second one is a progress function, saying how much progress have you made, uh, a, a function that we can use to calculate the progress made in this behavior. Um, so. The, we've implemented other things. There's a uh, data store and a dispatcher. The data store basically collects all the information. It's a simple key value store. The dispatcher is important because, uh, again, we had to have, implement a bunch of dispatchers. While, so in our experimental setup, we deploy some in simulation and some in the actual test bed, and so those need different dispatchers. Uh, I'll also come to another reason why we need a, a dispatcher. And there need to be two services provided on the drone. The first one is the ability to store information. So as it's searching the world, it says store X and store Y and so on. And second one is being able to localize. At any given point, it can query saying which region am I in, and our system gives it back here in region X. Karma uh, goes to about 10,000 lines of code, and like I said, it's implemented on top of CDI. So here is a, a video of uh, this in action. Let me quickly describe. There's a lot of stuff going on here. Let me describe what's going on. Uh, the central cube is the hive. You can think of the world as being divided into nine regions. Uh, it's a three by three square block. And uh, think of a flower patch in the top area. So initially you want to go search the world, then find the flower patch and then go pollinate that area. What you see here is the allocations for these two behaviors. The first search behavior. Uh, this shows how much progress is being made. So initially it's white because there's no progress that's been made. Uh, and as there's progress made, the tiles get darker. Uh, for the pollinate behavior, initially everything is dark because it thinks there's no uh, work to be done, but as it finds the flowers, the work to be done. Okay. And this is the number of, uh, this, this will show the number of MAVs deployed. Again, these are being shown both as tiles and as graphs. Uh, so let me run this. So, in this simulation, there are 45 simulated bees and five helicopters that are flying in the test bed. The test bed helicopters are shown as ovals, and the uh, simulated bees are shown as circles. Um, so initially, there's only the search task, like I mentioned. They get deployed for search. Uh, here you see two perspectives of the visualization. You'll also see as a, uh, a view of the test bed shortly. Um, so they go into the individual regions and they do circles, which is sort of a simple behavior denoting that they're getting the coverage you want. So that's the view from the test pad. Basically, they reflect the ovals that are uh, in the, uh, and here's the pack of flowers that you can see. So. The, as, as, as the first piece come back to the hive, that's when uh, the hive knows that there is a patch of flowers here. 
then it starts deploying MAVs to pollinate, and those are denoted by blue circles. Uh, so the yellow ones indicate that they're doing search, and the uh, blue ones indicate that they're uh, executing uh, the pollinate here. And as you can see here, now it finds that there is uh, a region where it has to pollinate. And I'm not sure if you can notice, but the color is changing it sort of as the work gets done. Um, and again, uh, somebody asked me a question how, of how deployment works and whether we do this in tiers. This deploys all of them, and then they come back, charge, and then they go out again. Uh, and this goes on for a while, and you can take my word that it does the right thing. So uh, you can see this helicopter is now doing pollination, so it does this by repeatedly landing on uh, the charts in that region. Um, and yeah, as the work gets lesser, it deploys only the right number of MAVs for the task at hand. So uh, we've run this on a variety of scenarios. Uh, this graph shows you the efficiency um, what I'm showing here is on the x-axis is the swarm size and the y-axis is the speed up in comparison to the first experiment, which is a And I'm also comparing it with an ideal scheduler, which, uh, and it's an offline idea. It's ideal because it knows how much work there is to be done. So what Karma does, uh, and this goes back again to Jeff's question, uh, we do an initial deployment, then the MAVs come back, that's when we know how much work is being done per MAV. Whereas the offline ideal scheduler knows exactly how much work will be done, which is why it always outperforms. Uh, but you see a finger speed up, which is what you want, uh, which, uh, which shows that it scales pretty well. Uh, we also demonstrate uh, the fact that it adapts by, and this is just one of the experiments. So what we do is we simulate wind in a third of the world, and uh, because the MAVs have to fight the wind, they do less work once they get to that region. And so the round trip times get reduced by 32%, and just funny, they do lesser work. But because we reason about how much work is being done per MAV per region, uh, what Karma does is it deploys more MAVs to that region so that it can balance the amount of work being done. The scenario takes a little longer, but you, you make equal progress. Uh, we've also demonstrated, uh, we also simulate error in localization, sensing, etc. And we show the paper that actually uh, does the right thing. So we've also implemented a variety of other applications. So we've implemented plume tracking, target tracking, uh, a comprehensive crop monitoring application uh, in the system. And again, uh, some of these results are the paper. Um, so one of the caveats of having a centralized system like this karma is uh, there is something called information latency. For example, so if you think of the swarm as a whole, from the time the MAV goes, senses something, to the time when it can actually, when the system can actually actuate or make a decision on that information, there's a gap. That is the gap. Uh, is the gap is uh, it waits for the MAV to come back to the hive, and that's when you can actually make uh, the decision. So that is what we call information latency, um, and this is a problem not for uh, static applications like crop monitoring, but for uh, application like target tracking. If I have a mobile target and I want to track that, I have deployed MAVs that are searching for it, it finds the, uh, the target in region two, they come back and tell the hive, the hive deploys more MAVs to, uh, to track that MAV, but that target, but that target would have moved in that time, right? So, and this comes back to your question. Uh, so what we did was we implemented another dispatcher, and here, instead of greedily uh, dispatching all of them at the same time, we stagger them across the whole time. So the time taken for the round trip and the charging. And what this does is, if you assume that all of them roughly have the same lifetime, uh, they go out and come back at, in, a, in a staggered fashion. So the information I get from a given region is fresher than what it would be if they were deployed really. And this is what basically I'm showing here. 
Uh, the x-axis has different swarm sizes, and the y-axis uh, is, is on a large scale, the information latency. So when was the last time I got information from this region? And that, is, that number is being averaged. And as you can see, if you have a continuous dispatcher, which is what I described, uh, in a staggered fashion, you actually reduce the information latency quite a bit. Of course, you don't fully uh, reduce it. To, to sort of fully remove information latency, what you need to do is have, needs to have a distributed version of this. A second extension we did was, uh, so, uh, my colleague uh, Spring Berman works on uh, modeling very large swarms uh, going on to like 10,000, I mean hundreds of thousands to millions of these and modeling them as particles. And she has a whole framework called Optrad that not only models it, but does a, has a stochastic way of doing task allocation. And so what we wanted to do was, Karma is a very deterministic way of <coughs> allocating, uh, of doing task allocation, which is to say, here's how many MAVs I need to deploy in this region. Uh, so we wanted to compare that to the stochastic framework she had. And what I did for this is I took her uh, methodology and I implemented it as a scheduler in our uh, framework. And so you can execute the same application using different schedulers and you can compare them side by side, uh, which is what uh, I did here. Uh, the, the first thing we learned was, obviously it's not, it's not quite an apples to apples comparison because the requirements that Optrad makes of uh, its MAVs is, is very minimal. Whereas in Karma we say, go do, uh, go execute behavior X in region Y, and you need to have some mechanism to navigate, for the MAVs to navigate to that region, whereas Optrad doesn't make any of these assumptions. But if you can actually satisfy these assumptions, then uh, Karma works I mean, it's twice as efficient. The caveat being uh, that it's very sen it's sensitive to error. For the kinds of errors we simulated, there's a 30 to 40 percent performance hit, whereas in the stochastic way of doing task allocation, the performance hit is about five percent, uh, five or six percent. And again, so before I run out of time, uh, initially I said research in this area is, sort of, is inherently interdisciplinary. Let me go back to the picture, and I sort of spoke to you about the coordination aspect of uh, our buildings at swarms. Uh, I've worked on many other aspects of uh, these systems. Uh, initially, uh, as a, in, in, initially in my graduate career, I worked on uh, this embedded system that was a functional prototype of uh, what our soldiers carry into battle, which was called Land Warrior. And what we wanted to demonstrate was given a script or a sequence of things, we wanted to demonstrate uh, power efficiency, or uh, devil power, power efficiency in this. And for that, uh, the particular piece of work we did was expose uh, voltage and frequency scaling mechanisms uh, to the application and do application specific voltage and frequency scaling to give the same level of performance while uh, getting energy efficiency. A second thing I did, uh, again, loosely as a reverse system, is uh, uh, I spent a part of my thesis on studying static and mobile sensor networks. And for this, we built uh, these robots called RoboMotes. Uh, these uh, are, are uh, complementary to the Motes from Berkeley, which were a popular platform for doing sensor network research. And so what we did was this could post a mode, and just like, and you could program the mode in TinyOS, and just like it can actuate the radio or the sensor, it can now actuate, uh, it can now move around using the same API. And we also built a tabletop testbed to accompany that. Uh, I also spent a part of my thesis working on wireless networking and particularly adapting it to mobility. Uh, the first two pieces of work was uh, doing uh, adapting mobile ad hoc networking protocols for uh, uh, for uh, power awareness. And here, what we did was the first piece of work was uh, instead of doing shortest path routing, can I do more power efficient routing and being with nodes being greedy uh, and them not uh, doing the forwarding. Uh, when they're low on energy. So, and the second piece of work was uh, extending that to saying, how do I maximize the network lifetime? I'm not worried about individuals, but how do I maximize the network lifetime? Meaning, uh, I want to uh, maximize the, fir the first uh, node failing. Uh, uh, a third thing, uh, uh, I, I spent again uh, part of my PhD working on these robot networks, and while, uh, while experimenting with these robot networks, one thing I found was because these were mobile nodes, there would be a lot of route switching happening uh, because the routing protocol did not know that it's actually running on a mobile node. 
And so I came up with, uh, particularly I was uh, using OLSR or optimized link state routing. And so I came up with these additions, uh, additional options to embed positional and directional queues that actually provided more stable routes on OLSR. Uh, for perception, again, uh, I was working with uh, these robot networks where these robots just had radios. And so we wanted to use the radio as a sensor. And the work we did here was using uh, received signal strength and the fact that we are mobile to uh, estimate course bearing. So if I have uh, five neighbors, by just using mobility and measuring signal strength, can I estimate roughly uh, which direction my neighbor is? Uh, and I know you guys have a big effort uh, on smartphones uh, under the phone lab umbrella. Uh, in 2009, I uh, co-taught a course with my advisor on Android phones, and as part of this, we, uh, three projects went on to get published. Uh, the main ideas here were uh, to exploit the sensing on these. The first uh, work was uh, uh, OCR Drive, which is basically uh, bringing optical character recognition onto these phones. And the main uh, idea here was uh, you take pictures of uh, not necessarily cleanly, can we clean them up before we send, it, send them off to an optical character recognition system. The second piece was uh, building a navigational assistant for something like a campus. And again, the innovation here was to use the phone as uh, an interesting uh, sensor. So you could point to a building and point to a floor and say what happens there and press a button and then it'll give you information about that particular floor and the activity in that particular floor. And the third one was uh, what we call 2.5D localization. So inside a building, GPS does not work. So can we localize the person in the, uh, on the floor at which he is? And for this, we, uh, what we did was basically uh, fingerprint a person walking up, a person walking down, and a person going up an elevator and down an elevator. And we basically be able to detect those events and then say exactly which uh, Estimation control, I worked, uh, I, uh, and this work was, uh, again, from the setup of using static and mobile sensor networks together. What I came up with here was uh, a distributed control law to estimate a level set. And what I mean by a level set is, suppose I want uh, the, the, uh, an isotherm where the temperature is 70 degrees. So uh, I, this distributed control law drives a mobile robot to that level set. Uh, not only does it drive to that level set, but tracks the level set. And it does this, does this by uh, having a deployment of static sensors and querying the neighbors. Uh, and secondly, uh, I used, uh, so initially I mentioned, we used the radio as being a sensor and uh, estimate course bearing. Uh, I used that course bearing to improve connectivity in a robot network. And finally, coordination. I spent a lot of time uh, talking about coordination. I also worked on coordination static sensor networks, particularly in tiered sensor networks. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on that. Uh, this brings me to future work. Uh, so uh, I hope you got a flavor of the kind of things I'm interested in. What I'm interested in is in building large-scale systems that combine computing, communication, sensing, and actuation. And examples of these are sensor networks, microwave swarms, the kind I've been describing. Uh, I can give you examples of assistive medical devices. And I've told you how we can do coordination. Some current work that I'm doing is uh, in solidifying the other pieces. So for example, what sort of sensing can go on microwave vehicles such as these? And we're using, so we're collaborating with uh, a startup in DC called Sentai, which builds these really low power, uh, lightweight vision sensors. So these are vision chips that give you a 16 by 16 pixel image. Uh, which is not much, but what you can get from that is what is called optic flow. And turns out, uh, in real life, bees actually use this for long-term long navigation. So using uh, these sorts of uh, low-power vision sensors and some inertial sensors like accelerometers and gyros, being able to build uh, algorithms that can control uh, uh, an MAV. So we've instrumented, this is a question that you had, we've instrumented the uh, E-Flight M6 to helicopters we have with custom electronics to control them and to sort of use these sensors to come with algorithms such as ego motion estimates, for example, how far have I traveled? Uh, be able to detect features, and we are particularly tailoring them for indoor applications, uh, such as in, in, in a building. So can I detect hallways? Can I detect intersections? Can I do And the part that I'm most excited about is actually taking this and doing uh, 
taking the system like Karma and building a distributed uh, system out of that. There are, uh, again, many uh, ideas that you can take from um, both robotics and sort of distributed systems. And this is where, uh, this is the kind of thing that I'm most excited by. So uh, in the last 20 years, there's a lot of work on SLAM or simultaneous localization mapping in robotics. But a lot of it is tailored for very heavyweight sensors like laser range finders and uh, cameras, uh, sort of fairly dense cameras. Uh, the second thing is these algorithms are fairly monolithic, so they are typically meant to be run on a robot. And I have particular ideas, so for example, uh, particular ideas of breaking these up into, uh, are coming up with distributed versions of this. And this is the sort of thing I'm most excited by in the near future. Again, uh, some, all these might sound like they're particularly tailored for my clear vehicle swamp, but I can sort of tell you how some of these uh, ideas map to other things like assistive vehicle devices of the kind that I'm interested in. Uh, I'm almost running out of time, so I'll, uh, let's conclude with acknowledgement. So I'd like to thank my PhD advisor, Gaurav Sakhatme from USC, the advisor that I've had at Harvard. Tariq Anakpal was my current advisor, Matt Walsh, who was my advisor when he was at Harvard, uh, Rob Wood, who's the PI of the Roe Project. Uh, graduate students I had the opportunity to work with, Brian and Jason, and Jason is now at Swarthmore. Postdocs I've worked with, Spring Birdman, who's now at Arizona State, and Richard, uh, who I work with currently and the organization that I've affiliated with, the Robotic Embedded Systems Laboratory that I got my PhD. For a large part of my PhD, I've affiliated with the Center for Embedded Network Sensing at UCLA, the Weeks Institute of Biology, Clean Spider Engineering, and SSR, which is the group I'm part of. I'll leave the uh, future work slide, and I'm happy to take questions. Kim, do I know? All right. Specify what dispatcher you're using when you run the system. What type of dispatcher? Yeah. So you, yeah. If and these are again are very modular. You can pick and pick and choose what I can run at execution time. You can say I want to use the continuous dispatcher because I'm sensitive to information. Other question? Yeah. So I, I missed the first time of the talk, so I may have be asking a bad question, but. Uh, in all of these practical applications you're talking about, perceptual uncertainty is is, is right. You know, even optical flow or detecting the flower. Mm -hmm. How does your framework handle uncertainty in the actual perception? Um, so I mean, it, the the original does not. It, it doesn't quite add. So, for example, detecting flowers. There are other pieces of the project which have been which have addressed this, but our system doesn't quite address that. So, for example, as part of the larger project, that there is this particular template matching sensor that was built to detect things like flowers. So, I mean, some of these problems can be solved at lower levels, uh, but uh, again, uh, I'm not sure if that quite answers the question from our system. So, uh, yeah, the way I see it is this is sort of in development and hopefully uh, we, we sort of pick pieces and solve particular pieces uh, as they work and then we go back into engineering and that's the way I think of it. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's a convincing answer, but that's the one I have. Uh, any other questions? So yeah? I have another question. Uh, I, this, this may have been addressed, but uh, so this is like a you, you, have like a hive or swarm based you know, central local, local position for message passing or for just communicating information. But uh, I like pick ants, for example, they don't do that, right? They have a their nest, or whatever you call it, but ants will drop markers locally yes. in, in the environment to, for the communication. So they can immediately know exactly where to go. So, what was the reason you chose this model rather than a more distributed, distributed model? Um. So the, f the first thing is, again, building any extra infrastructure gets hard. Right? So we, we started with the assumption that these MAVs are very simplistic. So they could potentially not have a radio, they could potentially not have anything. And so what can we do with, with, with that assumption? And we're gradually relaxing these and moving on. Particularly in terms of doing uh, th things like stigma G, which is what, which is sort of uh, embedding information in the environment, Again, you need additional infrastructure, and it's not clear that's the best way. 
The second reason was some of this is very analogous to what bees do. So bees actually don't communicate in the, in the field. They, they go out, do something, come back in the hive, and the hive is the medium for communication. Um, so this bears fairly close resemblance to what bees do, uh, which, is, which was where we started with. Um, uh, but like you said, this area is right for any, I mean, a variety of such ideas, including embedding things in the environment. I mean, I'll follow on a distance question because I'm just like, you know, we've talked about this in the past because I think they're, the, the model of, you know, go out, do something, come back, you know, there's no, there's no data exchange between insects during flight, right? There's no possibility for that type of thing. So, I mean, have you guys quantified, you know, the possible, like, the, the loss in optimality? I mean, there's a simplicity that comes along with this, which is appealing. Which is, yeah. But, at the same time, I mean, it's it's difficult, you know, it's difficult to convince someone maybe that, that some of these things wouldn't help, right? Like if a bee could tell another bee something as they're flying past each other, or if they could communicate some information rather than having all the information flow through the hive, right? Which is expensive to get back and forth to. So if you guys, even even under some, you know, real, re, you know, reasonable assumptions, try to quantify the the loss, the extra, what's the price you're paying in terms of latency or energy cost I mean, or, latency was or the by simplicity of the of the program model. So the latency was captured by information latency. So that, that, that's sort of the a direct representation of how much I'm losing, right? So from the time when I collected this information to the time when I can make decisions on this information mm -hmm. is basically information. Sure. So that's, a, that's something we've quantified, again, across applications. Uh, the complexity questions get gets harder because it's not clear, it, it, it's very really application driven. Mm -hmm. It's not clear how much communication is actually required. And again, there have been other pieces of work before me. So for example, there's this other work, again, done by Radhika, where they demonstrate that they, for some applications, communication is actually harmful. So they actually go and sure. quantify. So there, there are other cases where that's just communication, not the coordination question, because that's, that gets, again, more murky. Right. But uh, yeah. It, it's 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 harder to quantify the, if you don't tie it down to a particular application. Um, yeah. but, well, right. I mean, you expected that the solution would be somewhat application specific, right? But if you take a specific one and said, okay, let's just let's design a, a, a more fragile solution for this particular application, and and see you know see what the trade-offs are. Uh, uh, I can give it to you in terms of like if you classify applications of as being fixed work in the world, so for example, like for, right? there's fixed amount of work, there the only places where you gain is in sort of the last counter. Mm -hmm. So if, if you think it takes how many other MAVs I have in my hive, 10 round trips, the last round trip is where there is some gain because I might finish the work in my region in half the half round trip and I can actually on my way back do more work in another region. Otherwise, it's, there's not much gain. Whereas if it's something more dynamic, then that's where you have more gains. Again, I don't know if that answers your question. But that, that's sort of a loose quantification of uh, where there is gain. Sure. Um, yeah. Have you ever considered to using like a mobile hive? Because I have seen other people. Because obviously, using mobile hive, you can start up minimizing the total task delay in some other sense. Right? So I think this goes to, uh, there is a, a lot of work on, uh, there, there's quite a bit of work on data mulling, which has similar ideas, where I have something that's mobile that sort of collects the information from maybe a static or a mobile sensor network. Uh, we haven't done any of these, but there are some algorithms that have been proposed. The reason why we haven't done any of them is, again, it increases the complexity of now the MAV, if it has to come back and recharge, it has to think of where the hive is, and that, potentially gets more complicated. It complicates the navigation to and back from the hive. And we didn't want to, uh, because there are, so one of the parts is you send an MAV out to a region, it does something there, and it has an estimate of how much energy it will take for it to come back to the hive, so that it can come back and recharge, and again go. Right? So if you have a mobile hive, this complicates that. You have to do some more estimation. And, but still, the calculation can be done at this centralized high side, right? 
because when since your coverage area is predetermined mm -hmm. and the first position of the hive might not be optimized, right? So as your task going on, you know that there might be a better a position to position that uh, hive. Sure. Uh, I mean, uh, there, there is potential gains that uh, I certainly agree that uh, we just didn't do this because I, I feel like that that's going to complicate things even more. Yeah. So, but if you don't have continuous deployment, then you can just do everything in stages. Right? So you just make sure yeah. that the guys come back to the same position. Sure. And that, then just that, that's a very good point. Yeah, sure. Uh, I can immediately see gains in, in a situation like that where right. so I just cover the regions that are nearby and then I move the higher and then I cover the regions nearby. Sure. Yeah, that's, that's a good idea. It's not something that we've tried before. That's a good idea. It's a stupid question, but you guys are not doing any theoretical analysis of all of these things, like uh, trying to figure out what you're using, for example, by not doing communication. I mean, I've, yeah, sure. Well, again, I'm, I'm not quite theoretician. We, we have some analysis of how the scheduling works, but uh, I'm not going to claim that that's. Uh, what Jeff is asking, I, I, I suspect, is going to be harder to analyze unless we tie it down. But, I mean, I don't have a model of. Potential. Potential. Yes. Potential. Any other questions? Are you talking tomorrow? Oh.